We might still have some people come on in, but let's get started in the interest of time. So welcome everyone. My name is Andrew Reidenbach. I'm a therapist here at My Therapy NYC. Welcome to our expressive arts therapy um, activity tonight. So happy to have all of you. And um, tonight's gonna be facilitated by Liz Athens, who's a very special person to me. She was um, a graduate or a professor at my graduate school and has now become a very good friend. And so just to tell you a little bit about Liz, she is a licensed social worker and assistant teaching professor at the Arizona State University School of Social Work. Her theoretical practice framework is the use of expressive arts therapies aimed at helping others optimize their nervous system and, and allow the body to return to healthy functioning in the aftermath of trauma and its effects. She uses visual art, music, movement, enactment, and imagination to help clients return to a baseline balance and gain functioning in the roles they play in their lives. Art, quite simply, can heal people. So um, without any further ado, I will turn it over to Liz. All right, thank you. Thanks, everybody. Um, God, I'm so excited to be here. Um, I love talking to people who are not in Arizona. <laughs> so it's always fun when I get invited to things where people are across the country. Um, it's a real like treat for me. And I want to thank Andrew for inviting me. Um, if there are any teachers out there who are joining us, you know that when your students become smarter than you are, like that's a big win. So uh, Andrew, I know that that is absolutely how I think about you. So I'm just really grateful to be here. Um, like I said, my name is Liz Athens, and I've been teaching at the ASU School of Social Work for I'm starting my seventh year full time. I've been teaching there for years and years before that. And um, I have really fallen. I was just telling Andrew um, a little bit about the origin story of me um, falling in love with expressive arts therapies, which are, if, if there are people who are expressive therapists, put it in the chat because I love um, meeting and talking and learning from people as well. Um, we're going to talk a little bit because I know it's a mixed group. I know there's a wide variety of people who chose to come here. There are practitioners and teachers and people who are interested in learning about expressive therapies, expressive therapies. My guess is that there's some artists in here as well. Um, we're gonna talk about expressive, um, expressive arts therapy, um, sort of at the 20,000 foot view, sort of what it is, um, which um, in my introduction talked a little bit about that. So it's the use of movement, music, um, music um, visual art, play, enactment, um, imagination, which can also include uh, drama, um, as a way to help the body do what it is naturally built to do, um, which is to self-regulate itself. Um, we know that self-regulation is really about consciously and unconsciously. So sometimes we um, use tools to help us um, self-regulate. When we're talking about self-regulation, we're usually talking about the nervous system, but sometimes we're talking about our emotional system as well. Um, that we wanna be able to have our nervous system regulate itself. Ideally, um, we wanna have a pretty large window or circle of capacity that we can handle the day-to-day -day stuff that's going on. Um, so we're gonna talk a lot about awareness. We're gonna talk a lot about um, we're actually not going to talk a lot about anything, but we're going to talk about awareness. We're going to talk about two concepts that I think are really important when we're thinking about managing stress, which is something that we all experience, um, interoception and exteroception. Um, but first, I wanted to tell a story that is so timely. It happened five minutes ago or maybe 10 minutes ago. I go to my uh, I'm getting ready. I'm sitting here. This is where I am when this happens. Um, and I hear the um, Amazon uh, delivery person show up and drop something off. And I remember it was a book that I ordered a couple of days ago by Rick Rubin. Um, this book came out today. Rick Rubin is the very famous and um, uh, very successful music producer. I think he's kind of a wizard. That's my guess. Um, and he wrote a new book that came out today called The Creative Act, A Way of Being. So I went and got the book. I came back here. I'm waiting for Andrew to let me into the thing. And I just open it up to a random page at the same time, wondering how I was going to start this, this, uh, our conversation off. And of course, chapter one is something called awareness. And I just want to read just a little bit. 
um because i think it is very in alignment with what we're going to talk about and i just got chills just thinking about the synchronicity of it all in most of our daily activities we choose the agenda and develop a strategy to achieve the goal at hand we create the program awareness moves differently the program is happening around us the world is the doer and we are the witness we have little or no control over the content the gift of awareness allows us to notice what's going on around and inside ourselves in the present moment and to do so without attachment or involvement we may observe bodily sensations, passing thoughts and feelings, sounds or visual cues, smells and tastes. Through detached noticing, awareness allows us to allows an un hold on. Through detached noticing, awareness allows an observed flower to reveal more of itself without our intervention. It is true of all things. So I think that is a little trippy that this book came just as I was trying to figure out what I would start with. Because I really think that when we're talking about expressive arts therapies, which is different than art therapy, movement or music therapy, um, it's different than drama therapy. Um, we are really talking about the process of creating an artistic experience, whether it's visual art, which we're gonna practice some tonight, um, or movement or music. Um, so it's about the process and what happens during the process rather than the end result or the product. When I use visual arts with clients, sometimes I'll say, we're going to make some art destined for the trash bin. So it's really not about creating something that we are um, proud of or that we're happy about. Um, this really allows people to let go of that inner critic, that part that says, well, my artwork doesn't look like someone else's artwork. Um, so it's really about us looking at how um, we notice things about our body um, that are going on within our body or in our environment um, in the moment. Um, we know that when we are under great stress, and so stress can be on a continuum from, you know, the smallest little thing to severe um, uh, toxic stress that comes from long-term traumatic relationships or environments. Um, and we all fit on that continuum somewhere. We're going to call it all stress tonight. We know that when we're stressed, we tend to be challenged with um, noticing some of those things. But most people, by the time they've made it out of their teenage years, have created a few um, ways that they know are helpful with self-regulation. Um, how do we calm ourselves down when we're feeling stressed? Um, so I think the first thing, and I'd really like for this to be much more of a discussion than anything else. Um, for those of you who are willing to do it, put in the chat how you, what, what are some ways that you manage stress? What are some of the activities that you do that manage stress? And Pollock and Andrew, if you can read some of them out when they come in, that'd be great. We have exercise, binge watch TV, walk, call a friend, run, go to the beach, yoga, reading, writing and painting, gardening, keeping busy, getting a massage, music, breathing, that's a good one, uh, walking, reading, listening to music, cry, checking in, cooking, pets, therapy, talking, journaling, calling a friend, sitting under a tree and breathing, hugging, lots of things. Yes, I love it. Um, and I think that um, for the person who said uh, that walking and going to the beach, um, there's a lot of research that's being done on uh, the importance of nature um, and well-being. So I think that we're going to see more and more um, research going in that direction, which is great because with research comes um, pretty innovative um, types of interventions that we can use for those of you who are um, therapists and practitioners. Um, binge watch TV, I love that one too. I think that um, 
having some, we spend a lot of time talking about mindful activities. I think that there's a real benefit and a case to be made for mindless activities too. <laughs> Ones that you don't have to spend too much time thinking about um, and being able to really tune out. I think that that's really helpful. Um, so before we um, go move forward, I wanna make sure that people have some things. I know that in the um, registration, it said to have a few simple, um, materials. So you're going to need to just have some paper, any kind of paper is fine. Um, at least two um, writing instruments. I mean, they can be crayons, um, pens, pencils, markers, anything like that. You need at least two of those. Um, some tape, um, any kind of tape, you're just going to tape the paper down and you'll see why um, that's beneficial. And then also you need a small something. Um, so uh, this is one of those kind of glass half marbles that people use in floral displays and things. Um, but you could also use a bottle cap, you could use a penny or a dime, um, but you need something that's small and round. So if you haven't gotten those things, why don't you gather them up just so we have them um, when we're to get um, when we start doing some um, some activities. Um, so I think that um, two things I want to make sure that we sort of understand, um, and this will be repeat for some of you, I think, is the concept of interoception. Um, so interoception really um, came to us originally in the, the uh, occupational therapy and physical therapy world. They did a lot of research on interoception. So interoception um, literally is the felt sense um, of our, and our own awareness of what's going on in our own bodies. So, um, some of us are really good at this. Um, some of us are not so good at it. So do you notice when you are experiencing muscle tension, when you're holding your muscles in that sort of tense or stressful spot, do you notice, um, when your heart rate starts beating faster or your respiration is faster? Do you notice when you start to get sick? You know, so some people can feel a cold or sickness coming on. Other people don't have, for some reason, don't have this, that sense sort of down and then they'll wake up and they're like, I can't believe I'm sick. Um, so uh, temperature is another um, interoceptive sense. Do you notice when you start feeling hot inside? So it's not about, whether it's hot outside or cold outside, but do you notice if you're having a temperature? Do you notice if your feet are cold? Things like that. When people are under a lot of stress, go back to that continuum, um, these can be some cues that people struggle with and can miss. And when we miss those things, we can tend to put ourselves in vulnerable situations, which can cause more stress. So um, those things are important. When we when we think about interoception, we're usually talking about physical sensations that are going on. Um, but in the psychology world, we also talk about it from a psychological perspective. So the emotional components of it as well. Do we notice when we're starting to get frustrated? Um, and not just do we notice, but how do we notice? Um, so I'll put it in the chat again. So when you are starting to feel stressed out, how do you, how does your body tell you that? Let's hear some examples of that. How does your body let you know that you're starting to be stressed out? All right, what do we got? Stomach ache, increased heart rate, shoulders pounding in the chest, lack of focus, um, tightness in the jaw, tired, off balance, nause nauseous, um, headache, migraine, neck pain, yeah, so, so those, those are, per, I mean, it's awful when we feel that way, but it's really great that people know that their body is giving them signals of this. Um, not everyone, like I said, puts those things together. Um, they could be stressed out and they could be having stomach issues. So we know that, um, we know what um, adrenaline and cortisol do to the gut and how there's that connection. Um, when we're feeling stressed out or nervous, that it's pretty natural for people to feel nauseous or have butterflies in their stomach, be upset, things like that. Um, headaches is another one that's very common. 
Um, and for the practitioners that are joining or are, are here with us, you also know that um, there's so much we don't know <laughs> about the brain and the body, um, the connection between the two. I make it sound like they're two different things, you know, our brain is our, is our body. Um, and that we're learning more and more because now we can take photographs of the brain while it's working and while it's being stimulated. So we're learning more and more about the brain and the body and the various systems. So the hormone system and um, neurotransmitters and um, all of the other kinds of systems um, and how they are connected together and how they feed off of each other. So interoception and an and, and interoceptive sense, that's a hard thing to say, um, is an important thing for us to be able to cultivate if the goal is stress management. We want to be able to notice sooner um, when we're starting to feel stressed out physically or stressed out emotionally. Um, exteroception is how we notice and respond to the environment. Um, things that are happening in our environment that make us feel safe or not safe. Um, when people have a poor exteroceptive sense, they tend to have poor boundaries. They either let lots of people in or they don't let anybody in. Um, some of my clients who have significant trauma history struggle a great deal with their exteroceptive sense. They don't trust that they will keep themselves safe. Um, which um, in the capacity of keeping themselves safe is okay, except that their world is very, very small. So um, that's what we don't want. We don't want to have people who are so locked into some damage control. And this can happen for all of us um, that um, the world ends up getting very small. Um, so yeah, so that's interoception and exteroception. Um, so I think we'll do our first activity because I want to make sure that we have enough time to do it and share it. Um, Paula, can you share that? Okay, so I always like when technology works. It's amazing. Um, so you're going to get um, a piece of paper. You don't necessarily need to tape this down. Um, we will for the other one. And you're going to take your little, whatever your little uh, circular thing is, a penny or bottle cap or something like that. You're just gonna put it on your piece of paper. Um, and what you're gonna do, and this is always a good thing for us to think about like the kind of person that we are. So um, I am an artist, I like making art and I like art to come out the way that I want it to come out. <laughs> and so I can be a little, um, I wouldn't say controlling, but like, I like to know what the end result is going to be. And so any, since I know that about myself and I'm not necessarily pleased about that with myself, I always look for things that um, make me um, a little bit uncomfortable with it. So I can sort of move through that process. So I learned this from a third grade art teacher this summer at an art intensive that I took and I fell in love with it. And I use it all the time, including boring faculty council meetings um, because it allows me to let go of what the expectations are for myself. Um, and it allows me to be a follower. So those of you who find yourself in leadership um, capacities, maybe you're a parent, maybe you're a teacher, maybe you're um, a therapist or a supervisor, maybe you're a doctor. Um, this is really not, it's really nice to be able to let someone or something else be in charge. So what we're going to do, and this is very uncomplicated, um, and for some people, it'll be very calming. For other people, it'll be frustrating, and I'll be interested in hearing about it. But what you're going to do is you're just going to take a pen or a pencil or whatever you got, and you're just going to literally push this. Um, I'm going to push this little uh, glass marble around, and I'm going to let it guide me. And it will guide me. Um, it will not go in a straight line. It will not... Um, it will not necessarily, I won't be able to push it along. So I would just say that you do this. So, and just start it. And then you're going to have to sort of take your cues by where it's going to go. And you can see that it, since it's circular, it likes to make sort of circular things. So I'd encourage you to just take yours if you'd like to join and try it yourself and see how it feels in your body.
when I do this, I tend to start off feeling tense and then I sort of relax into it, which is, that's just sort of what my process is. I encourage you to try a few things, speed up. Um, can you tell it. us like, what are you exactly using a marble thing in the middle over there? So yeah, so it is, um, it's a small, I, I'm calling it a marble, but it's like a half a marble. Um, and it's, they're little, um, let me see if they have a name for them. They're decorative filler. <laughs> um, I got this at an uh, art supply store for $5. Um, and I think they use them in, um, in like floral arrangements. You know, sometimes they'll put a whole bunch of them in the water. Yeah, but do you put your pen on top of that and in there? Oh, no, I push it along. So you push it on the side. So if this is it, I'm pushing it along. Oh, okay, okay. But why don't, why do you need that to push it along? It's more uh, fun? Because it, because it makes the mark, so. You can okay. see where it goes. Oh, okay. That's fun. All right. Thank you for explaining that. That makes sense. Yeah. You end up with, with something that you can see. I think that it, I mean, I think you could do it without one, but I don't know. I don't know if you've noticed the sort of wildness about the, you know, how it goes off all on its own. So yeah, what happens for me with this is I, like I said, I start off um, almost automatically trying to get it to go where I want it to go, um, which it never does. Um, and then I can find myself um, almost unfocusing um, and just sort of following this little uh, glass gem around and it can be very calming. Um, anything that we do tonight, I'm sure there are going to be some people who find it calming and other people who find it kind of activating. Um, and we want to have both of those things because we know that when we're stressed, some of us um, will feel anxious, you know, so we'll be sort of like up and others will feel um, dissociated. So if we had another, um, if we had another kind of uh, parallel, um, it would be extreme anxiety to extreme dissociation. And uh, we all have time on either one of those poles somewhere along the line. And so it's important that we have some activities that help calm us down because repetition calms the brain down. So pattern and repetition helps the brain calm down and novelty um, helps activate the brain. So that's where we see um, neurogenesis, that's where we see neuroplasticity, is when the brain is actually required to work in a, in a way that it hasn't normally had to work. So I'm interested in what people thought about this. And again, I know that not everybody is going to like it or it's going to feel comfortable or, um, I don't know, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Not comfortable, but um, yeah, maybe comfortable is the word. What did people think about it? Uh, free flowing creative space. Um, they liked it. It's soothing. Someone loved it. It was fun. Kind and gentle. So yeah, so one of the things that is helpful when we're using expressive arts as a way to manage stress is to see how could you stack things one on top of another. So we know that the brain is activated um, in different ways at different times using different mediums. So um, when I do a lot of this work, I try to incorporate movement and music or sound on top of it. Like that requires that the brain does a lot of work. Um, it's moving the brain away from that sort of stressful um, pattern and pathway into having to, you know, uh, incorporate and interpret a lot of things. So anytime that I can use um, art with movement and music, I'll try to do that. Liz, um, two quick questions, ahead. sorry yeah. about that. 
Um, one is someone just commented saying that they would be curious to see what it would be like to do it when stressed. Um, and then also a question is, what do you think about adding a steady inhale and exhale while doing this? Yeah, I think that that would be great. Um, when I'm thinking about, um, so one of my, I'd get in trouble with my boss and my director by saying this um, in like a faculty meeting, but I'm growing more and more um, weary of the idea of following a consistent evidence-based practice. I think that it gets rid of practice wisdom. It gets rid of like what we know about ourselves and what we need and what's going to work for us. And those of us who are therapists, what we know about the relationship with our clients and what we know about um, what it is that's going to benefit them. So I think that some of those things, like I wouldn't necessarily use um, art, music, and movement for every single person, um, but I like the idea of um, considering what the breath is going to look like for that. Um, if we changed our breath, how might our visual change? You know, those could be interesting things for us to um, think about and practice. Um, and I agree that um, when you're calm and relaxed and doing something voluntary um, and you're doing a calming exercise, maybe that's not the best, best way for us to know whether it's going to work or not. So I encourage people to try it out if you're feeling stressed out or if you have um, a couple of minutes before like the next Zoom meeting that you have to go to or the next class you have to go to or the next thing that's on your agenda. Um, I think that this can be helpful, especially if you get into a practice of it. So it becomes something that is um, calming, but also activating at the same time. Um, so that can be really helpful. Um, I think that the breath always is, you know, it's one of, it's one of the few things that happens involuntarily, but we also have some control over it. We don't have too many things that are like that. So anytime that we can involve the breath in a very practical way, um, whether we're doing breath work or we're just becoming more consciously aware of our breathing, um, those things I think are really helpful. And there could be lots of ways that you could adapt this. Um, it also could just be a fun thing for um, adults and kids to do. Like I said, I learned this from a third grade art teacher who utilized it. Um, so they did this and then they um, did things with this, which is like my favorite form of art. Um, so you make something, you cut it up, you make it into something else. It might not last that way. You keep, you know, keep cutting it up and some, some of it ends up getting thrown out and some of it ends up being something that is like my favorite work. So you could use this as um, a coloring page, you know, so you could now cut, uh, you could now color in or watercolor in some of these things. So that could be really helpful um, and fun as well. So, so that's one, I, I don't know what the name of this is. Uh, maybe we should uh, collectively come up with a name for what this activity is. Um, marble doodles, I don't know. If anyone has a good idea, put it in the chat. And I think that that could be really helpful. I like it when things have a name. So, and while we're talking about this, I think it's good to think about like, who might you use this with and how might you use it? Um, would you use it for yourself? Not just this, but you know, any other expressive activities. How might you use it with yourself, with your children, with your students, with your clients? It's good to think about those things and not have this live sort of in a bubble, you know, outside of that. Um, so let me know if there are other questions, but I want to talk about bilateral work. So if we have folks who are um, therapists in here that use either somatic experiencing or EMDR or other sensory integration um, techniques, you know the importance of using the left and the right um, hemispheres of the brain as a way to optimally train the brain to manage. Um, there's a dog in my backyard that does not belong there. <laughs> I just looked out my window. I'm going to see if it's my neighbor, but um, so the left and right hemispheres of the brain and the easiest way to do that um, in an art sense is to draw with your left and right hands at the same time. So um, 
So we're going to do that. Um, this is where you're going to need to tape your paper down onto a flat surface. Um, we don't realize when we are, um, when I can use this over here, uh, when you're writing, you tend to be able to hold the paper down, but when you're using your left and your right um, hand at the same time, the paper could tend to go all over the place. So we're gonna do um, two types of drawing. They tend to um, activate sort of different parts of our nervous system. Um, that is by design. I'm gonna tape down my other piece. I always just tape two pieces down, one on top of the other, so I can just pull one of them off. And I'm going to use these. I'm a sucker for a good uh, a good art supply. I'm using these um, art crayons, which are like um, oil pastels, kind of, but they're just non toxic. Um, I'm going to use these because they have a nice bright color, and I know that you guys will be able to see it. But you can use crayons, you can use pencils, markers, um, colored pencils, pens, whatever you got. So this is another example of that interoceptive sense. So I'm going to have everyone before we start pick up a um, pick up one of your um, mark making uh, items, pen, pencil, in your dominant hands, and notice what happens in your body, if anything. Do you notice that anything has happened? Are there any thoughts, any emotions that are kind of coming up? And let's put those in the chat before we get started. What do you notice? It's in your dominant hands. Prepared, let's go. I'm ready, anticipation, work mode. You guys are so smart. All right, so while we're doing that, so now I'm gonna have you put that one down. And I'm going to have you pick up um, another one or that same one in your non-dominant hand and see what you notice. Many people, including myself, have a profound sort of like, ooh, how would you describe that feeling? What's happening? <laughs> Uncomfortable, puzzled. Hand is tense, awkward. Yeah, so I end up like, I'm like, do I even know how to like hold a, hold a, I don't know, like this maybe, I don't know. So, so yeah, so just notice that, like that is a real interoceptive awareness that you notice. Um, so we're gonna do two types of um, bilateral drawing. Bilateral drawing simply means using the left and the right um, hands at the same time. And we're gonna do two kinds. So the first one we're gonna do is symmetrical. And the second one is asymmetrical. So symmetrical bilateral drawing, that's a, that's a mouthful, um, is simply your left and right hand doing the same thing, um, creating the same pattern. So you could do um, lines like this. My favorite one to do is to put both of the markers in the center and do a little circle and come back and do a little bigger circle and a bigger circle. But whatever it is you want to do is perfectly fine. It just needs to end up being that your left and your right hand are using the same pattern. And again, notice, does it still feel super weird and uncomfortable and that it's puzzling? I like to switch them around so I can have just some color on the other side. But whatever you want to do, And you can do other shapes if you want to. Just remember that they need to be both doing them at the same, in the same direction. We'll talk a little bit about crossing the midline in a minute, but.
All right. And when you feel like it's done, just like any other art project, it is done. And I'm interested in how people felt about that. What did you notice came up for you or what did you notice um, about that process that um, feels interesting? So you can share it in the chat or you can have people raise their hand if they wanna jump on and talk. I don't know, Andrew and Pollock, if you're up for that. Yeah, whatever works. You've been dropped up in the chat. Looks like the chat is getting some stuff, but also feel free to unmute yourself and chime in if you'd prefer. So, so far, it looks like we have increased confidence. It was fun. Once again, a certain amount of freedom in the creation, comfortable and calming, focus. Can I share verbally? Yes, please. Yeah, I feel like at first it was like the hands were against each other, like it was like right versus left, but then like by the end it was like, oh, a little partnership, they're just working together. Um, Perfect. I really felt the bore. Yeah, and that's, and that is um, a pretty common experience. It starts off feeling awkward, just like anything else that is new for you. Um, and you can move towards it feeling more comfortable um, and you know, more comfortable and as patterns sort of develop, that helps as well. Who else would like to jump on and share how that was for them? And like I said, some people don't like this at all. So this is not about saying, you know, I don't, I assume that there are some people who um, it doesn't feel like that, that it was that comfortable for them. We have a couple more things in the chat. So um, having the right, this person's dominant hand working helped with the movement of the left. It was started off soothing, um, started off unsure, but then as they went, kept going, um, they wanted to keep going. The dominant hand felt weird, the non-dominant felt calm. Interesting. Yeah, so think about how, so I, when I first learned this, when I first learned this, it was a long time ago. Um, and I was facilitating an intensive outpatient program um, for people with substance use disorders. And I just happened to have, you know, cause that's an open group. So people were coming in and completing. Um, I just happened to have a group of folks who really struggled with anxiety. Like it took them a long time to kind of come in, sit down, kind of get their wits about them. Um, and I started having them do this and we just did it on a clipboard, you know, with two pencils and they would do that. And I found that it really sort of like moved them back into their body. And I included some other things. So they had to have their feet on the ground. We did a little, you know, grounding exercise around that. And this tended to, I mean, it wasn't a, you know, a magical thing. Um, it just allowed people to move from like the stuff that they were worried about or that they've been dealing with. Um, into a place where they're just a bit more in control of what was going on interoceptively. It doesn't mean that we didn't talk about those things, but instead of being um, coming from an anxious place, they were coming from um, a more sort of stable space. They were, they were in a space where they had a bit more ego strength about them. And they could also um, talk more about it. Uh, that's my own anecdotal evidence, but that's really what I saw. So I used to have people do this every day, three days a week, we would come in, we would do a little meditation, we would do um, a little bilateral drawing, um, symmetrical bilateral drawing. Sometimes we would do asymmetrical bilateral drawing, which we're gonna practice as well. Um, if the group was particularly low energy, that can be helpful. Um, I think this is really helpful to work with kids, especially in a classroom setting. If you have um, kids who are very anxious or very, you know, just sort of high energy, um, this can provide some real focus direction. Um, and when you've got kids who are on the other end of the spectrum, who are sort of zoning out, um, the next one we do is much more kind of activating. Um, we live on that continuum one, you know, in one place or another, all of us do. Um, and I think that, um, 
The other thing that can be really helpful to think about is what are the types of materials you're going to use. Um, so if you have, if you yourself or you are working with people that are very easily overstimulated, you probably want to think about um, just using two good old fashioned pencils. You know, you don't want to have big sort of dramatic colors. If you've got someone who is really checked out, um, kind of interoceptively, um, using bright colors, bright markers can be helpful in activation. I really love those um, markers that smell. Um, they remind me of what art school when I was a little kid, but you've got bright colors. You've also got that olfactory sense that can be helpful in activating. Um, it's a good um, use of $10 if you have it to buy a set of those. Um, I can't remember what they're called. Hold on. They're Mr. Something, I think. Um, I have all these things right here. I can't think of them. If anyone knows what they are, those, those bright um, chisel tip markers that have like fruity um, flavors or uh, fruity scents to them, they can be helpful. Um, okay, so like I said, uh, symmetrical bilateral drawing is really helpful in calming the nervous system down. Um, and asymmetrical bilateral drawing can be helpful in activating the nervous system when, if you are kind of um, hypoactive as opposed to hyperactive. Um, so we're gonna do the same thing, piece of paper taped down, um, two, uh, different, uh, two different uh, markers. They can be the same color. I just happen to have two different ones. And the only thing with this is that um, each hand is going to move independently. So they're not going to be following a pattern. Um, you're just simply going to draw and allow these things. You'll feel like this feels a little bit like the uh, marble activity. And I think personally that this feels much more energizing and activating. So why doesn't everyone give this a shot and then we'll uh, we'll check in um, in another minute. And if you have four colors or six colors, you can change up. So give yourself another 30 seconds. All right, so if you haven't put your markers down, why don't you go ahead and do that? Um, Paula, can you change, can you unpin that so we can see me? Thank you. So I'm interested which one of them felt more um, in alignment with what you know yourself to need when, it, when you're thinking about some kind of drawing like that. Is it the symmetrical one? or the asymmetrical one? I'm interested in what people, if you felt a difference, it's sort of in the energy or if you noticed anything um, kind of arise in your body, what did you notice? It's got lots of things. Um... Yeah. Some people like the symmetrical one better. Asymmetrical felt exciting and relieving and playful. Symmetrical was more calming. The asymmetrical was energizing, fun and energizing. Um, one person was able to focus more on the symmetrical one, but both were fun. 
there was a freedom in the asymmetrical, another person said free to be asymmetrical. Yeah, so like I said, everyone's gonna know what's gonna be work, what's, what'll be helpful for them. Um, what I tend to find is the bigger, the better. Um, using um, used like old newspapers, if people still get newspapers, um, I do. Um, I, in my garage, I have a whole wall of newspapers and I'll go out and do um, like a big version of this. Um, I really like the infinity sign, you know, so if you're doing it sort of things like this, um, then you're moving your whole body, which has like an added layer of um, kind of restorativeness to the body. You're sort of moving yourself back into your body. Um, and one of my teachers, Kathy Malchiotti, talks about that process that and she's talking about um, kind of trauma recovery, that the whole goal of um, uh, trauma resolution or toxic stress or stress resolution is to bring the body back into being alive. Um, most of us know people, um, even if we don't know their stories, that are pretty tightened up. You know, they're pretty serious. They have a hard time um, being lighthearted, um, being um, curious, and maybe even a little impulsive. Um, those things are all part of a normal um, and healthy nervous system. We want people to be able to do things like that. We want them to take, those of you who work with teenagers or you have teenagers, maybe you are a teenager, um, you know that um, one of those goals of making it through adolescence is to be able to um, learn how to take calculated risks. Um, and if people are under a great deal of stress, they either take very uncalculated risks and put themselves in dangerous situations, or they have a very, very hard time trusting um, their own risk-taking abilities. And I don't mean risks like jumping out of an airplane, but um, even risks within relationships. So um, having a well-regulated nervous system is really key for managing um, managing all of those, managing the stress around relationships, around um, growing up, moving through the developmental stages that we all are. Um, so those things are really important and we need to have some strategies for that. But really it's not about strategies. It's about being aware of what's going on in our own body and knowing what it is that our body needs. I think that um, in the end, it is up to us to know those things. Um, and so some of us are going to use that for ourselves. Some of us are going to use that in aid to helping others. Um, I really like expressive therapies as a standalone therapy, but I think that it also works very, very well in conjunction with other types of activities. I think it has an inherent mindfulness component to it. So if there are mindfulness-based folks here, um, it really works very well. I have found that um, using visual arts for people in meditation can be really helpful, especially if folks struggle with the visual component of meditation. Um, I am one of those. Um, the minute someone is sending me through a, um, a guided meditation and they're talking about a glowing ball of light coming into my body, like you've lost me. But if you have me do things like movement um, or visual arts or percussion, other types of music, um, I can snap right into that meditative space. So really it's about um, very practical awareness of ourselves and also the people that we serve, whether it's our families um, or clients or patients. Um, I think that a lot of these things are really very helpful and they're also very transferable. So you, you can see that the materials that we used are things that most people have in a junk drawer or in an office somewhere. Um, you'll wanna think about that kind of stuff when you're prescribing um, activities or homework or things like that. What are people going to have that's available to them? Want to make sure that we're equitable with things like that. Um, doesn't mean that we can't use the nice fancy things if we want to, but we just have to be sort of aware of um, what are the unintended consequences of um, equity issues around things like that. 
Um, what questions do you guys have for me? Or comments or whatever, but I'm happy to answer questions. I think we have a little bit of time. Yeah, we've about five minutes or so before we need to wrap up. Okay. Who has questions? If you're questions, feel free to put them in the chat, or if you'd like, you can unmute yourself. So whichever way you're more comfortable with. So one question is, are there more um, art activities you might suggest that have like therapeutic benefit? Yeah, there's a lot of them. Um, I really like movement a lot. Um, even sort of small things. I've been telling the story a lot lately because I've been teaching about this a lot. Um, one of my favorite jobs and also one of the most challenging is I worked in a long-term residential treatment program for pregnant women with substance use disorders and trauma history. Um, and unfortunately, it was the worst trauma stories that you had ever heard over and over again. And they stayed with us for a really long time. And I worked where they lived. So I was coming into their house or not a house, but like I was coming into their building where they lived every day. Um, and they would, I would often see them um, looking out the window at like me coming in and parking. I'm like, oh boy. So they would you know, I told them, I'm like, you cannot pounce on me when I first walk in the door. Like that is my boundary. You can't do that. But inevitably, like people would be deep in their feelings. They would be having pretty significant trauma reactions because they were in a safe place and in a relational space. And so that happens. Um, and I would, if they came to me, if I saw them in the cafeteria, or I saw them somewhere, I would just start rocking, um, putting my weight on my left foot and my right foot, like not anything dramatic. And I would make them do that with me, which is a whole concept of co-regulation, which we didn't even talk about. Um, and that I was really the one that was in charge of regulating their nervous system, which is a crazy thing. Um, and they could still talk to me, but I'd be like, I'm not talking to you unless you follow me with this. And so moving left and right, you're crossing your own midline a little bit, which is a very powerful thing. Um, that can be something that's very small, but like really, you know, it can be really powerful. Like I watched a lot of people go from being completely dysregulated to being able to have their wits about them. And then we could have a conversation about whatever it was that was so upsetting to them. Um, so movement, dance, things like that. Um, movement with a rhythm um, is very calming and soothing. Movement against rhythm is really jarring, but that can be helpful too, especially if you have folks who are dissociated. So playing a music and having people actively move against the beat, um, it feels very uncomfortable, um, but it can get people who are very dissociated. Um, and I don't mean dissociated in the clinical pathology term, but although sometimes that as well, um, but people who are really sort of low energy, they're not in their bodies. Um, they're not sort of of the environment that that can be really helpful. Um, body mapping is another one that I really love. Um, those of us who have been around for a long time, we used to like draw people's outline of their bodies. Don't ever do that. You don't ever need to do that again. Um, that was a boundary crossing. Like, I can't believe that we did it for so long in the eighties and nineties. Um, but, um, a simple, um, outline of a human body, you can download them off, um, the internet or you can just make one. Um, have people, this is one of my favorite um, bottoms up processes. So have people do sort of some meditation, um, see whether, you know, and they'll do a body scan, then they draw um, the sort of sensations in that. And then they move up to the top, that cognitive place, um, that higher level um, understanding and communication and have people talk about that. So body mapping is a great one. Um, I could come back and do a whole thing just on therapy stuff. If we wanted to do that. So we have multiple more questions, but maybe just one or two more. Okay. And then also everyone, um, in our follow-up, we'll include Liz's contact information. So feel free to yeah. follow up with her. But yeah. um, where did it go? Do you know any techniques that you can incorporate in nature and expressive arts therapies? So one of my favorites is nature mandalas, you know, so have people go out foraging for things. And um, I don't usually call them mandalas. I'm very cautious around, you know, the appropriation of that. Um, 
So there's something very um, calming about going and gathering things and then putting them in um, order as they sort of see it fit. Um, I tend to think a lot about the patterns of nature and the patterns of the human body as well. And some of those universal patterns and symbols that we see. Um, I think that journaling outside is really very helpful. That's pretty uncomplicated. You just go find a spot and maybe task people with a few journal prompts or just let them go, you know, let them write what comes up. Um, meditation in nature, I think is great. Um, sun, you know, nature bathing, I think is good. Um, um, it's really more about, you know, again, with, with expressive therapies, it's really about noticing what's going on with you and what's coming up. And so those things can be helpful in nature. Awesome. And then I guess um, there are a couple more and unfortunately we won't have time to get to them, but I guess just last uh, question is if you have any resources that you think might be of particular interest to people. Yeah, so I have a couple and I'm gonna um, share them with Andrew. I have a couple of books that I really recommend. Um, one of them is Trauma and Expressive Arts Therapy by Kathy Malchioti. And the other one is, um, she has a new book out that is, she didn't write all about, um, that is an edited book that has, it just came out. I actually haven't even read it yet, um, but lots of different chapters utilizing um, different expressive therapies. So I'll make sure that Andrew has that and they can send it out um, in the follow-up email. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for being here. And thank you again, Liz. It was really wonderful. Um, I hope everyone has a great evening. And we will be sending out a follow-up sometime this week. Again, it'll have Liz's contact information and then those few uh, resources that she mentioned. So again, I'll look, be on the lookout for that follow-up. And thank you again, everyone, for being here. Thanks for having me. This was fun. <laughs>